In one of my previous videos, I've discussed how social issues such as the homeless teenage Toyoko kids have been on the rise in Japan. And according to research conducted by the Tokyo Metropolitan Government, as of January 2019, there were 1,126 homeless people living in Tokyo. And with the total number of homeless people in the entire Japan being recorded as 4,555 in the same year, Tokyo came as the top city which had the largest number of homeless people in the entirety of Japan, with the city of Osaka coming in at a close second place with 1,064 people. This may seem as relatively low numbers compared to the United States and the homeless population of some of its largest cities. For example, more than 60,000 people were recorded as homeless in the city of New York alone according to a 2018 research. And could such be the potential reason why, when many people think of Japan, social issues such as homelessness or a prominent city area for the homeless as in the case of Skid Row in LA does not come up much in the minds of general people? Other than areas such as of course Kabukicho, which is the biggest red light district area of Japan, where the homeless teenage Toyoko kids have made wide news in the recent years. So with that said, in today's video, I'd like to bring a fresher topic in which I believe no Japan-based YouTuber has yet to introduce, which is the list of well-known homeless areas as in the skid rows of Tokyo, as well as explain the history of the homeless problem in Japan. So let's get into today's video. First, it would make sense to provide you guys with a bit of a geographical background of the city of Tokyo itself. There are 23 special wards in Tokyo, as you can see on the map. And each special ward has its distinct set of image, as in the level of income that an average resident of the ward earns, as well as their occupation. For example, when many discuss the wealthiest ward located within the entirety of Tokyo, and perhaps Japan itself, the special ward of Minatoku will emerge in the minds of many Japanese people. When people think of the political center of Japan, many will think of the Chiyoda Special Ward, where government institutions such as the National Diet, the Prime Minister's official residence, and the Supreme Court, as well as of course the Imperial Palace, are all located within the ward. So I think you guys can probably guess that when we discuss the so-called mini skid row areas of Tokyo, these two wards are not going to be mentioned on the list. But at the same time, I remember before when I was walking around late at night near the Tokyo Station area, which is also located in Chiyodaku, there were indeed a handful of elderly homeless who were sleeping on the sparsely located benches around the area. I'm not sure if this is still the case, but we can know from this instance that the homeless in Japan are not all located into one specific area, but are located in different city areas based on factors such as geography and the amount of crackdown that is conducted in the area during the given phase. But with that said, there are indeed some historically well-known areas around Tokyo where the homeless are known to gather. We cannot talk about the homeless areas of Tokyo without first discussing the area of Shinjuku. Just to briefly introduce the area to people who are new to any type of geographical info in regards to the Tokyo city area, the Shinjuku ward is truly an interesting area, to say the least. While being home to administrative centers, such as the government of Tokyo, as well as being a major center of business by having the headquarters of major corporations such as Seiko, McDonald's Japan, and Subaru, it is also home to the biggest red light district in the entirety of Japan. While there are many upscale, high-rise tar mansions for the wealthy in areas such as Nishinjuku, there are also many areas where rent is relatively cheap, as in the case of Shinokubo which is largely regarded as the Korean town of Japan. Simply said, Shinjuku has it all. And one also cannot discuss Shinjuku without first mentioning the Shinjuku station, which is widely regarded as the world's busiest railway, with an average of more than 3 million people utilizing the station on a daily basis. And the areas around the Shinjuku station west exit is where large amounts of homeless people are historically known to gather during the night to morning hours. Way before the homeless teenage Toyoko kids around Kabukicho area of Shinjuku ever became a problem, the west exit area of Shinjuku station was famous for having a line of people waiting to sleep within the station floors. 
the homeless who find shelter in the west exit of Shinjuku Station seem to largely use cardboards to lay on the floor, as well as basic blankets during the winter to keep themselves warm. And while their number has decreased over the years, with stricter crackdowns and security guard intervention between the hours of 6am and midnight when people are still commuting, a significant number of homeless are still said to be sleeping at the station between the hours of midnight to early morning. As to exactly why many homeless flock to the west exit of Shinjuku Station, its location has some obvious benefits, such as how the indoor location allows them to escape from rain or the harsh, cold weather during the winter. The historical precedence of many homeless finding shelter in Shinjuku Station West Exit probably also aids to some degree in terms of being able to reduce the level of social stigma in which they receive from the general public. To elaborate, with more strict regulations towards the homeless in Japan compared to the past, most stations just completely shut down their shutters to the public once its operations are finished around midnight. Meaning that the vast majority of train and subway stations around Tokyo are no longer a place that's suitable for the homeless. And another widely famous area in Shinjuku that is considered as the skid row type of location in Tokyo is the area below the Tokyo Metropolitan Government Building. One may ask how there could be such a prominent homeless area right beneath the building of the local government itself. However, the situation is not much different in the US either, as once again in LA, for instance, there are homeless tents across the very streets of the US courthouse. This area below the Tokyo Metropolitan Government Building is known to be frequented by a large number of homeless in Japan for reasons, such as the relatively low levels of crackdown against the homeless conducted by the area's law enforcement, with the rare exceptions being times such as during the Tokyo Olympics when the homeless were told to leave the area before the opening ceremony. Other reasons as to why the homeless in Japan frequent this specific area is it being below a highway, meaning that they are able to avoid the rain, as well as the existence of various volunteer groups which often provides food for the homeless in nearby areas such as in Yorogi Park. Other well-known areas for the homeless around Tokyo include the Ueno Park, located in the Taito Ward, as well as areas beneath the highways of Sumida River, as well as the Arakawa River. Now that we have discussed the areas in which many of the homeless find shelter in Japan, let us now discuss the history of the homeless in Japan and the direction in which this social phenomenon seems to be heading towards. When people thought of the homeless population in post-war Japan, they originally thought of Shinjuku Station West Exit Area. Back in the 1980s and 90s, there was a line of homeless people sleeping in cardboard boxes, stretching from Shinjuku Station all the way to the nearby Tokyo Metropolitan Government Building. The cardboard boxes of the homeless were so symbolic that, in fact, an art movement in Japan by the name of Cardboard Art began to become popular throughout Japan, where young artists would draw and decorate the cardboard homes of the homeless. However, a large crackdown against the homeless were conducted in Shinjuku in the late 1990s, which forced the homeless to vacate the lands. Perhaps some people who are in their 50s or 60s now and have lived in Japan for over 30 years may remember the resistance in which the homeless in Shinjuku demonstrated against the authorities widely being all over the news during that time. Tragedy against the homeless in Shinjuku continued as there was a large fire in the Shinjuku area in 1998, killing much of the homeless population who found shelter in the area. But despite such history, we can still observe a number of homeless people still sleeping around the hallways and stairways of the Shinjuku Station West Exit, although its numbers now are nowhere near that of the past. So what exactly happened to the large number of homeless population who were forced out of Shinjuku area by the authorities in the 1990s? Where did they head towards? This period marked a transition for the homeless population in Japan, as while much of them found shelter in train station exits in the past, a large number of the homeless population migrated to the public park areas which are scattered around Tokyo, such as the famous Ueno Park, Yogi Park, or the Shinjuku Koen. Perhaps the most famous one of these parks is the Ueno Park, which is widely popular among locals and tourists alike for its beautiful hanami during the spring. And at the peak of its popularity, 
many claimed that the park was filled with homeless tents left and right. But once again, I think you guys can now kind of predict what will happen next, especially if you have watched my Tokyo Homeless Teenage Kids video and my theory on the Japanese wakamo culture. So basically, now that the moles, which in this case is the homeless and their tents in the eyes of the authorities, have popped up into emergence in the middle of the Ueno Park area, now it was a time to whack them. For example, when the members of the Japanese imperial family made schedules to visit a museum located inside Ueno Park, the entire homeless population who were residing inside Uena Park at the time were forcefully evicted. Due to the severity and forceful nature of the evictions, much of the homeless population at the time described the incident as quote-unquote mountain hunting as they felt that they were being hunted like animals by high authorities during that time. Such types of quote-unquote hunting seasons often reoccurred unfortunately, which subsequently led to the gradual decrease in the number of homeless people who found their shelters in various public parks located around Tokyo, such as in the case of the Ueno Park. But as in the case of the Shinjuku Station West Exit, the homeless population has not been eradicated entirely out of Ueno as well. In fact, on your very computers, through Google Maps, you can still spot plenty of homeless tents and baggages with their symbolic blue wrap being on the very streets near the Ueno National Museum of Nature and Science where many of the homeless are known to return to at night. Some sad anecdotal words from people who experienced homelessness in the past was that within these homeless communities and public parks, they still had to, quote unquote, abide by the rules of the homeless. As in, there were these boss figures who ruled the area, and you had to receive permission from these so-called boss figures in order to set up your tent anywhere within the park. Some of them even received so-called rent from the other homeless, as otherwise, the other weaker homeless person would often be physically beaten. As if being homeless and having to cover yourself in three layers of blankets during the freezing cold winter on a nightly basis was not enough, it is once again sad that some people still felt the need to conduct power play even in those dire circumstances. So with that said, now that a large portion of the homeless population who lived in the public park areas were forced out by the frequent evictions and government crackdowns in the late 1990s to early 2000s, where did they head towards afterwards? As I've mentioned previously, the train stations were also not much of an option due to similar crackdown and enforcement measures. One destination in which the homeless subsequently headed towards was the government subsidized apartments, which subsequently provided them with a house address which is especially critical in Japanese society. The reason why having a house address is so profoundly important in the case of Japan is due to the fact that whenever you want to do pretty much anything in Japan, such as getting a job or getting a phone, to being eligible for government benefit payments during an economic crisis period such as during the pandemic, you need a house address. So by living in these government subsidized apartments, many of the homeless were able to finally leave the streets and in many cases, start a new life. And for those of the homeless who are not so fortunate to be able to receive a subsidized apartment by the government, the current favorite area for them is near the riverbanks, such as the bank area along the Sumida River or the Arakawa River. For one, as locations such as the Sumida River or the Arakawa River is not located in the heart of the city of Tokyo, such as in the case of Shinjuku, there is less government crackdown and administrative intervention. Secondly, the larger size of land compared to inner city areas is another conspicuous benefit in the eyes of the homeless. This means that many of the homeless who live in areas such as under the bank highways actually build a proper hut-like structure to pursue their living rather than a mere cardboard box or a temporary tent. Some of them even grow crops in the riverbank lands in order to satisfy their nutritional needs. However, living in areas such as under the riverbank highways is not only with positives. When there is considerable rainfall or a typhoon which hits the nation, these areas are the first to flood meaning that the homeless who have built their huts and livelihoods in the area most often lose everything in their position due to these floods. There were even instances of the homeless who refused to leave their huts during seasons of heavy rainfall and subsequently got swept by the strong water flow. Another problem which also most often makes its appearance in Japanese media is the homeless being a target for violence and bullies. For instance, as many in Japan often visit the riverbank area in order to conduct leisurely activities such as lighting fireworks, 
there is often reports of conflict between the visitors and the indulgent homeless population within the area. But while the situation of homelessness in Japan does indeed look grim based on its history and its continuous existence even to this day, some may claim that the homeless situation in Japan is still nowhere near as bad as it is in the case of other countries such as the US. And statistics indeed support this. As I've mentioned previously, there was recorded to be 4,555 homeless people in the entirety of Japan according to government figures, while the city of New York alone had more than 60,000 homeless living within the city. However, there is a certain level of reasonable doubt which should be headed towards the figures provided by the Japanese Ministry of Health, Labor and Welfare. To elaborate, the research was conducted based on naked eye observation alone, which obviously raises doubt on whether the public civil servants who were out on the streets collecting the data were able to successfully spot every single homeless individual living in Japan. Another potential problem is the issue of selective range of homeless people who are counted into the results. Specifically, the definition of a homeless individual, according to Japan's special act in regards to supporting the autonomy of the homeless population, is, quote-unquote, those who rely city parks, riverbanks, roads, train stations, and other facilities as their place of stay in order to live their daily lives. This means that the increasingly larger subset of younger generation of homeless in Japan who conduct their homeless way of life as in the form of sleeping at a 24-hour McDonald's or at an internet cafe are not counted into the research results. And with the average age of the homeless in Japan based on government statistics being 63.6 years old, it is more than clear that the younger subset of the homeless population in Japan are not being counted into the statistics. In fact, according to Kiyona Kenji, who operates a non-profit organization based in the Ikebukuro area of Tokyo by the name of Tenohashi, which is currently providing incredible level of support for the homeless in Japan, stated that there is estimated to be 300,000 total number of potential homeless in Japan that are hidden from the public eye. Is it possible for me to provide a perfectly utopian solution within this 20 minute video on the possible measures in which Japan as a nation could take in order to fix this issue of homelessness of almost 300,000 potential number of people? The answer to that question is no. While I can indeed attempt to do so, it would largely be quixotic in nature, as we often know that theory and empirical reality is often far detached. But with that said, in my humble opinion, what does seem to be a clear necessity is for Japan to allow its people to more easily receive the residence cards and the my number cards, without necessarily having to possess a house address. Many homeless in Japan complain that being homeless in Japan is a vicious cycle, as once you are homeless, you have no address to your name. And once you have no address to your name, you literally cannot do anything in Japanese society, from getting a job to receiving pandemic welfare benefits. And because they can't get a job, because they do not have a home address, they are in no income, which means that they have no money to rent a house, which means that they'll continue to be forced to be homeless, so on and so forth. So although there are, without a doubt, myriad advantages which is entailed by Japan's historical emphasis on excellent execution of the rules and following the manuals to the T, when it comes to dealing with the homeless, who are literally going through their lives with the sole goal of surviving one day at a time, a little more flexibility may indeed go a long way. 